If you're a subscriber to the channel, then you'll know that last week I dropped a video on the Pixel display and talking about it going from the prototype all the way up to the alpha. During that video, I talked mostly about the hardware, but I did show some aspects of the software that it was running. In this video, I'll talk about how that software works and how it connects to the ESP32 controller board and controls the Pixel display. So let's start with being in Unity and showing the application that I had running during the last video. Now this application is very bare bones, it's very basic. All I needed was something to test the display was working, whether that be with images that change over time, with text or with colors, etc. And you'll see all those coming up in a moment. So I wasn't going to go overboard with this. I threw up this application in an hour, it's nothing too advanced but I will go over the code and how it all works. And now I'll talk about the features you saw. So the first one we have is the image tab. And this is just some basic images, some logos of my company that I use that I could put up behind me during a stream. I also enabled the drag and drop functionality, which you'll see here, where I can actually drag this monkey image onto the actual display application and it will appear on the display behind me. Now, if you're interested in drag and drop functionality, let me know in the comments and I'll put up a little video that shows how that actually works in Unity for a Windows application. Okay, so the next tab along is color. And this is very self-explanatory. It's just a color slider or three options for red, green, and blue. The only one that's particular in here that you might be interested in is the green. Let's say you wanted to do a green screen. Now, a lot of people will have a drop curtain or a sheet or something that pops up behind them, but this can be, this can get shadows, etc., that throws off the actual green screen and doesn't look correct. The nice thing about having a green screen that's lit, it means that it's consistent across the board. And that enables you to get a really good crisp cutoff for yourself in that green screen. Now, obviously this display isn't huge, but it's big enough if I wanted to put it behind myself that I could do some clever green screen technology and then maybe do the rest as a cutout from a sheet. So let's move on to timer. Now I created this for a special somebody and he knows who he is. I won't go into details, but all it is is you start a timer and you stop a timer. And you can set how long you want to have on there. I have 30 by default, but you can set it by 60. Now, obviously I don't want to go up too high because this is only a 32 by 32 resolution pixel display and anything too long, you know, four numbers or anything like that is going to show up terribly on the display. So I kept it to around 60 as a maximum. Moving on, we have icons. Very basic icons for Somebody's got a question, there's an exclamation point. Somebody's got an idea, so you press the bulb icon or the YouTube icon. Now, obviously these look a little bit rubbish on this display here because this is being resed up for the actual application, but on the Pixel display, they look a lot crisper. And you can imagine what I'd use these for on stream. It's pretty self-explanatory as well. The next one is effects. And these are the ones that look great behind you when you're talking. Here you've got a neuron. And all I did is I found a load of GIFs online on a free site, downloaded those, broke those out into the layers as PNGs, and then set it as an animation, like you would do a 2D sprite for a 2D game that you were creating in Unity. Now, why didn't I just take it from a GIF and do all the rest? Because this is a very basic application. I'm only creating a few of these. I didn't want to have to go into all the breaking out of the GIF and doing all the work in here. I just wanted to see that functionality working as quick as possible. And there's a few on here I found, like the lines you've seen previously, or the obligatory Tron video that runs in the background, which looks pretty neat. Moving to the last section, we have text your standard scrolling text. Now I can sit on stream and have this behind me saying warped imagination, or maybe pop up, have you got a question? And we just have the input box there to be able to type in whatever text we actually want to have typed in. Now at the very bottom of this application, we have a few other options. One is to clear the screen and that will make the screen go blank behind me and then restart the screen by pressing it again. Now. The reason for this is, say, you don't want to have it on. 
You can turn it off nice and easily without having to click through or shut it down via the IoT or anything like that. You can stop the display and start it while keeping the application going. The next one is a slider, and this goes from 1 to 255. And what this does is it sets the brightness for the LEDs themselves. Now, usually when you're doing brightness on an LED display like this, you'll basically tone it down in the colors of the actual things you're sending across rather than setting the LED brightness. And I'll go into that in a future video when I start really breaking down how to do the colors. At the moment, I just send across the straight RGB that I'm actually receiving in the image. Now, the funny thing is I added a load of power to this so I could get super bright on the LEDs themselves. Then when I started to go on stream and use this, I realized that anything above about 20, if there's a lot of white in the image, it's gonna blow out the camera. So when you're creating this, you might wanna save a little bit of money, buy a lower power supply and not have it go all the way up. The last button, and it's quite an important one, is actually flip. Now, it won't do anything on the application you see in front of you, but what it does is on the display, it actually flips the image around. And you'll notice that sometimes when you go on stream or on camera, the image is actually flipped in the horizontal. And this is enables me to keep the camera standard and not have to change it in OBS, but rather just change the display. So have the pixel display flip for me. And it's super useful to have that functionality. So let's dive into the Arduino code that's actually running on the ESP32 board. Now, the only thing that's really changed in this from the prototype video, and I will leave a link in the description to the prototype video if you wanna go and see it and hear me talk more in depth about what all these things do. The only thing that's changed here is that I've switched out from using the NeoPixel to using the NeoMatrix library. And the reason for this is that with this display, instead of having it going from left to right on every line of the display itself. What I've done is saved the length of data cable that I would need to run all those lines back and forth to just having it zigzag up and down. And this means that it goes left to right on the first line, and then on the second line, it goes right to left and obviously zigzags all the way up. Now, the, because I've done that, I can't use the NeoPixel library, I have to use the Neo Matrix library, which enables you to set that as one of the options. And it's very important when you're creating this sort of hardware to know the distinction between what should be in your Unity code and what should be on your display. You don't want your Unity code doing all this stuff, you want it done on the display. Your Unity just sends over what it thinks it should send over and the display deals with how it displays that information it receives. So it's got the zigzag, and these just associate how I've got the orientation of the display up. Now, I won't go into too much detail. As I say, a lot of this is in the prototype video and I don't want to repeat myself, but just to run through quickly, we have us setting the data pin out. We talk about setting up the Wi-Fi connection because this is actually on the opposite side of my room from my computer. I run a lot of cables around and I don't want to have to run another USB cable for the length of my room and have the repeating and all the rest. I just simply have this as a Wi-Fi setup. And then we start the display and have it show. We have initializing all pixels to off. In the loop itself, we check that we have the client, i.e. it's there, and then we start sending across the information. And if you remember from the first video, we actually send across RGBA. Now we're not using the alpha for actual coloring, but instead we're using it for commands. So here we use the A, if it's set to B, to set the brightness. And if it's set to C, we clear the display. That gives us some nice functionality without having to write loads of check bits and all the rest to work out what's coming across. It's a bit of a cheat and in a real piece of software, I probably wouldn't do it like this. It's a little bit hacky, but if you're creating this display, it will probably do for you like it's done for me here. Now this has changed from the previous one uses that Neo Matrix library, and instead it's using draw pixel, which requires you to set an X and a Y position rather than just an index of where the pixel is you actually want to set, the LED you want to set. And here we send across the color, RGB, which is the same as last time. The next one is just to say, show this, you know, and increase the counter of what we're actually playing with. And that's pretty straightforward. 
So now let's jump into Visual Studio and we can look at the free classes that we're actually interested in. I won't go into all the UIs, you know, how a button is pressed and how it launches something and all the rest. That should be pretty straightforward. If it's not, leave a comment and I'll explain where you can get more information for that under the video. Now, this hasn't changed an awful lot from the prototype video, but I will scan through it so you don't have to go through that video if you don't want to. Now, the first class is the display class. And this is a scriptable object because I want to store the IP address and the port of what I'm connecting to. Now, I know if this was a production version of a piece of software, I would actually have a setting drop down that you could go in and you could change the IP address, set the port, etc., of the display you're actually interested in. But I'm not doing a production piece of software. I'm quite happy to have this as a scriptable object for each build. I know the IP address of the display that I'm running, and it's set on my Wi-Fi mesh network that I have here in my office. So we get a TCP client and a stream, and we start going at it. Let's jump right down the bottom to the connection and disconnection. This is where we set up our TCP IP. Uh, a TCP, sorry, client, and we also disconnect when we're finished. The next thing to look at is the fact that we want to know whether we're connected for other things. And at the very bottom, we have send byte, which just sends the byte across the stream to the actual display itself. Jumping back up, we have those two pieces of functionality you saw in the Arduino code for clearing the display with the C and setting the brightness with the B. Very straightforward. The next class to jump into is the capture class. And this is the one that sits on the camera component because it uses the on render image functionality. Now, again, this is pretty straightforward and same as the last time, but all this is doing is it's taking the render texture that the camera is getting and then it's getting the texture pixels, the, the bytes basically, ready to be sent over to the display. The only thing I've added in here is I put a little flag at the beginning, serialized field, that says flip. And I've done a very unoptimized flip of the texture to basically send that across. Now, it's unoptimized. I don't care because that's all I need to send across. What I like to get through to a lot of people is that when you're building prototypes, get them going as soon as possible. You know, get through the grunt work. If you slow yourself down by creating and making things super optimized at the very beginning, you probably won't get the project finished. And you never know, you might not need to optimize that code. And if you don't need to, don't, there's no reason to. And that's what I've done here. And then that's about it for the capture code. It's not changed very much from what we saw previously. We jump to the manager and all the manager does is it takes in the device, takes in the capture and sets a refresh rate, brightness. The only thing that's really changed in this code from the previous one is the fact that one, you can turn it on and off, which is done in this functionality here. You can set the brightness via that slider and we have that flip display option that just tells the capture we want to flip what we're actually showing. And that's about it for this particular piece of software. It's not very long, it's not very big, but it does exactly what I want it to do by showing fast paced images or displays or icons or rolling text, etc. If you saw the prototype video, you'll know that you can also do things like render out 3D objects onto the 32 by 32 display. And I'll have more of that in the future when I do little videos showing some fun little applications I create for this display over the years. If you're interested in anything in particular that I've shown here that I didn't explain in depth, then do let me know in the comments and I'll make sure to bump up a video or put something in a reply that tells you where to look for or what I did in association with that particular thing you're asking. Now, if you like this video, press the like button and the usual, if you haven't subscribed yet, consider subscribing, it helps the channel. And as always, thanks for watching.